It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. All right, folks, welcome back to the program. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, as promised, uh, we do have on the line constitutional attorney, talk radio host Chris Ann Hall is back with us. Chris Ann, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Oh, it is absolutely my pleasure. Uh, so uh, I I sent over this article when when I uh, you know was was proposing for us to do this interview, and it's this uh, article from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. It's entitled "The Second Amendment." The author is a guy by the name of Jack W. Holt Jr., who uh, was an attorney general here in Arkansas and also the chief justice of the Arkansas Supreme Court. So, uh, Christian, did you have a chance to read this gem of an article? <laughs> a gem it is. <laughs> yes, I read it. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, he has some uh, history, as he calls it, uh, history, mm. um, w- which really just amount to dates. Um, but, you know, yeah. he, one of his articles, he, he writes, uh, uh, let, or one of his paragraphs, let's recount a little history. When the 13 colonies ratified a new constitution to create a strong national government capable of raising federal or a federal army, they adopted the Second Amendment to reassure some states <laughs> that the federal government would not abolish their citizen militias. So basically, mm-hmm. he's saying, look, you know, it's just about uh, citizen militias, not about your personal right. What, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I mean, his, his premise fails from the very get-go because it's built on a on several false premises. Number one, uh, the Constitution was not created to create a strong central government. You hear that all the time. That's the new modern rhetoric, uh, the idea that be, the uh, because we, we changed the um, Articles of Confederation, that we must have done so to create a government that was bigger and stronger and nothing could be more true. Um, they actually, it, it, when you look at the way the Articles of Confederation were, were written and the changes that were made, they actually didn't create a stronger federal government in the modern sense of the word. Uh, what they did was created the exo- uh, opposite. They, they created a more defined and more limited central government that had more authority in the powers that were delegated. So to say that it was stronger uh, it today is used to imply that we made this, you know, that we made this be a myth on purpose. But in reality, our founders uh, were dealing with issues during the Articles of Confederation of a central government that was ill-defined and ill-capable of doing the work that it was uh, tasked to do. So the Constitution gave better definition, which created a more defined, more limited federal government, but then also gave them better direction on how to accomplish the tasks that were being delegated. Uh, The second false premise is that the Second Amendment was created to, to sort of empower this government-managed uh, militia, which is also uh, completely false when you actually know the history and you don't listen to a law professor or read some, some public school textbook. So when you actually read the writings of the people who drafted the Second Amendment, who who debated and ratified the Second Amendment, you, you learned that the Second Amendment was, was actually written for a group of people that they call the whole body of the people. That's a phrase uh, that I am quoting that is, that is absolutely uh, said by every person who had anything to do with the Second Amendment, that the Second Amendment was for the whole body of the people. And the leaders in favor of the Second Amendment, uh, in favor of the ratification of the Second Amendment, as, as it was worded, not only called it the whole body of the people, but then made a specific distinction that the Second Amendment did not include government and those in power. Uh, the third false premise that he makes, and, and you, didn't, uh, you didn't actually get that far in your quote, <laughs> was that the Second Amendment was written to, uh, so that slave owners could keep their slaves under control. Uh, 
that is also uh, an incredibly false premise and uh, said only by people who are completely ignorant of history and those who have been uh, manipulated and brainwashed by the, the the government propaganda education system. And I know you use those words these days, and you sound sort of tinfoil hat-ish and, and uh, you know, extremist, but in reality, the history is very, very clear. At uh, Liberty First University, our online training program, we have several courses that teach that this premise that slavery was uh, was actually uh, uh, something that our founders wanted to uh, continue, that they were permissive about slavery, and that the Constitution was actually written to to uh, enable the the existence of slavery, and that all of our founders were a bunch of rich white misogynistic slave owners. Uh, we absolutely at libertyfirstuniversity.com destroy that premise with actual history and the words of the framers themselves. We have, my goodness, we have three courses now that deal with that, that, that completely destroy those ideologies. We're talking with Chris Ann Hall. She's a constitutional attorney, uh, also a talk radio host, and you, you heard her mention uh, the website libertyfirstuniversity.com. Please check that out, folks. You see it right up there on your screen. Um, you know, what's interesting about this, Chris Ann, is that if if you take his initial premise uh, as fact, which you just uh, historically dismantled it, um, it really <laughs> it, it really does um, uh, confirm what the left is wanting to do uh, with our gun yeah. rights today. I mean, because if what if what if his premise were true that, and somehow we've reinterpreted the second amendment uh you know to a modern day individual right to keep and bear arms uh then if what he says is true then the government should be able to take our weapons away as long as we have what a national guard in the state right right you know and that's the disturbing thing um there are people who know the truth who still repeat these lies but the disturbing truth is that I actually believe that this judge thinks he's speaking truth. And uh, when you when you take his premise, his false, the series of false, it's not just one, but the series of false premises, and believe them to be true, he really makes a very compelling argument. Um, and, and that's what happens when, when your knowledge is seasoned with such... Uh, deep-seated lies. You can you can simply uh, repeat dates and make things look historical, make things look accurate. But that's why we need to we need to really, as a people, train to learn how to identify the false premises. So when you set up the stage as he does, uh, the entire argument following falls apart because because, again, it's set on a faulty premise. That's why, you know, Paul, that's why we, we have been traveling for the last eight years and sometimes in teaching the Constitution. Uh, and sometimes people say to us, well, Christiane, what are you really accomplishing because you're just teaching the choir? But when we realize that the choir has been taught these lies for decades and have, and, and we as as believers in the Second Amendment have a difficulty in identifying the false premises, we have difficulty in refuting the false premises publicly uh, because we, we really lack a, a strong foundation because we weren't taught that. Uh, that's, that's why teaching the choir is so very important. Mm, yeah, I completely agree. Um, speaking of, uh, you know, teaching the choir here, let's can we can we talk a little bit about birthright citizenship um sure and the 14th amendment it you know came up i guess in you know, tuesday uh mm -hmm. it was revealed that uh, president trump got asked a question by an uh, i guess an hbo show or something and, and he said mm -hmm. yeah we're thinking about an executive order now so first off let's let's talk about the uh, unconstitutionality of executive orders and then maybe move into what the 14th amendment was written for well, executive orders have their place, 
the problem is not the the use of exec it is not the uh, let me let me put this way. the use of executive orders it's the application of executive orders so the purpose of an executive order is the president to give command and direction to executive agencies so the problem with executive orders they become un unconstitutional when those executive agencies reach out Side the executive branch or executive uh, orders change laws that have been constitutionally established. Uh, I think we first have to sort of understand that it is possible for Congress to create a law that is unconstitutional. It, it seems to be something that is not widely understood, yet, yet it, it ought to be uh, widely accepted given the fact that the Constitution is that itself says that laws written outside the Constitution are invalid. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the problem with an executive order would be an executive order that is written to change a constitutionally established law to alter the proper application or enforcement of uh, a constitutionally established law or amendment or something like that. So uh, if Donald Trump were to write an executive order to change the classification of someone's citizenship, and I'll, and I'll just say simply an executive order that gives someone citizenship or takes someone's citizenship away that has been established by Congress through the Uniform Rule of Naturalization, then uh, that would be an unlawful executive order because the president doesn't have the authority, constitutionally speaking, to change the status of citizenship of any person. And believe it or not, that is something that was discussed by the drafters of the Constitution to be specifically a denied power to the president. Uh, Alexander, Alexander Hamilton talks about it as, uh, the president cannot make denizens of aliens, and that just simply means he can't make citizens of aliens because that was a power that was exercised by the king. And so the drafters of our Constitution when creating the office of the president said, we're not going to make a king. We're making a limited and defined president, so we don't want a president to be able to confer or deny citizenship. Uh, however... If Donald Trump writes an executive order to properly enforce a law or properly enforce a principle of the Constitution, then that executive order would be lawful because the purpose of the executive order is the president to direct the powers of the executive branch and the primary power of the executive branch is to execute the laws of Congress that are constitutionally created, but first the primary or uh, the primary power of the executive branch is to enforce the Constitution. So the president takes an oath to the Constitution. Uh, interestingly enough, we hear this all the time, the president's job is to keep the people safe. No, the president never takes an oath to protect and defend the people. He takes an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. And so if Donald Trump were to write an executive order and word the executive order in such a way that it is defending a constitutional principle or a constitutionally established law, then the executive order is lawful. So, does that make sense? Yes, it, it does. <laughs> so, there's, so there's a, a right way to do an, exec, an executive order in this context and a wrong way. So the right way would be maybe just, hey, uh, 14th Amendment uh, – uh, doesn't allow for birthright citizenship. I mean, and and, and would this then probably get fast tracked to the Supreme Court? Um, what 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 are what are your thoughts? I mean, it, it would need to get fast tracked to the Supreme Court, you would think, because it's going to get challenged. Right. Well, well, the first thing we have to understand is it is true that the Fourteenth Amendment does not establish birthright citizenship. And how we know that is that we go to the, the people who actually drafted and uh, sponsored the 14th Amendment. One of those sponsors uh, is a senator by the last name of Harrell. And if you go to the 
the congressional record of the day when they were when he actually proposed the 14th amendment he specifically said that the 14th amendment would not apply to visitors to this country to uh, aliens in this country and would not apply to foreign ambassadors who were here working within the United States. Mm. So the drafters of the 14th Amendment, the sponsors of the 14th Amendment, which dictates the meaning of the 14th Amendment, specifically say that birthright citizenship was not the intent nor the proposed application of the 14th Amendment. So we already know from from congressional record and historical facts that the 14th Amendment does not establish birthright citizenship. And so any argument otherwise is simply also based on false premise and uh, obviously on an agenda to alter the uh, 14th Amendment outside of another constitutional amendment. And so if Donald Trump was going to write an executive order for it to be lawful, I would suggest that it would say something uh, akin to, as the President of the United States who takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, it is my job to enforce that document as it was written, as it was intended. It is clear by congressional record that the 14th Amendment was never intended to establish birthright citizenship. I would probably, as President, even quote yeah. mm-hmm. the uh, congressional record and then simply say, as the executive uh, leader of the executive branch, it's my job to enforce this properly. So this executive order instructs my agents and their agencies to no longer uh, allow or establish the false application of the 14th Amendment to allow uh, birthright citizenship. And I would also suggest that Donald Trump put in there, as because you know it's going to be challenged, as, as a sort of challenge repellent, just simply a little clause that says, as the leader of the executive branch, I am empowered with an essential power to check and balance both the legislative and the judicial branches when they operate unconstitutionally. <laughs> Any legislative act that establishes birthright citizenship is contrary to the Constitution, which empowers me through my check and balance authority to uh, to not enforce that law. Wow, yeah. It seems like, I, I, ho- I hope they're listening, Chris, and because that's pretty comprehensive. Uh, and he did reference yeah. in that, uh, you know, in that interview that uh, his attorneys have, have told him that he, he can do this. And it seems like everybody in the media said, no, you can't do this, but you're saying that there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Right. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. And um, obviously the wrong way is what the media is latching on to. He cannot say, uh, you know, he cannot change the status of citizenship. So here's the thing. Uh, He can't, he, he, he could not legally, constitutionally change those who already have birthright citizenship. Excuse me. That would be something that would not fall under executive order. But what he can do lawfully and constitutionally is say, from this day forward, we will not allow this. Uh, Last question. We're talking with Chris Ann Hall. You said this was, you know, you you quoted the, uh, uh, you know, gentleman who was associated with the 14th Amendment. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. When did this change? When when did they say, oh, by the way, if you're an illegal immigrant and you have a child here, uh, that child is now citizen of the United States with all the benefits and rights. Uh, When did that change? Well, you know, as many things, it's, it's this, this gradual reinterpretation and application via agenda. And a lot of it is actually being conducted by Congress through uh, immigration and naturalization, uh, alterations to the Immigration and Naturalization Act. And so there is language in the Immigration and Naturalization Act that would uh, would would lead people to believe that Congress is accepting this kind of uh, interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Hmm. Chris Ann Hall, I appreciate you being with us. As always, folks, check out uh, the website. Her great class is libertyfirstuniversity.com. And I'd love to do it again, uh, Chris Ann. Thank you so much. Have a great oh, morning. Sure.
Thank you. You too. All righty.